thank you, Lord Jesus, for being strong enough that the rain couldn't contain you. Being strong enough to carry all of my problems. Being strong enough to pay the price for my sins. Being strong enough to bridge the gap between us and Almighty God. For every person in this world throughout history. Jesus, we give you this time now. We pray that you would use it. Teach us. Open up our hearts. That we would hear a word not from some guy, but a word from Almighty God. Amen. This is your time. And we do this in your name. Amen. 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 I am Chaplain Susan, the lead pastor of the Gospel Service. Thank you for coming out to our Easter service. Uh, the sermon title this afternoon is called The Undefeated Lord. And the story uh, goes back to Chicago. So just follow me. Slide guy. I'll let you know where to go. Okay. Chicago in 1993. I lived in Chicago for three months. I lived in a homeless shelter uh, in uh, Chicago, Illinois, for three months. The Olive Branch Rescue Mission. 1047 West Madison Street it was, and it's no longer there. They moved it. They wanted to make that area a little nicer, so they just kind of like cattle, just moved the hard-living homeless population to different parts of town. The Olive Branch Rescue Mission was a couple miles from, um, from where the Bulls played. It used to be the United Center, I think, or something like that. Uh, Cabrini Green, famous housing project, was close by as well. And I'm going to tell you the stuff that I saw while I was there. Uh, I lived with guys in the drug rehab program, and I thought I was so cool walking down Halstead Street on Friday night with my little posse. My mother, on the other hand, she lost about 15 pounds worrying and praying for me in that time. But I made it through it unscathed, and, uh, and really had a remarkable, life-changing, eye-opening experience while I was there. One of the uh, things that I did when I was there was a study on Christian drug rehab programs. To find out how these different programs, and if you're familiar with Chicago, you've probably heard of the Pacific Garden Mission. Uh, Unchained is one of their famous programs that come out of it. The Olive Branch was another Christian drug rehab program as well as a homeless shelter. CCIL. There were a number of them, Victory House. And they all had different philosophies of of how to lead someone to a place of sanity and sobriety in drug rehab. And one of the common factors in all of them was Narcotics Anonymous and Cocaine Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous, all of these AANA, CA programs. And so I spent three months probably going to, I mean, four a week. You know, every addict in Chicago knew who I was. And, uh, and it was all part of this research to kind of understand how these different Christian programs uh, lead people to a place of sobriety. And I fell in love with the 12-step program. Whether you are an, uh, an addict or not, I think that the 12-step program can be helpful for you for healing and for wholeness and for really discovering not just who you are, but who God is as well. Um, I really thought it was biblical. I thought it was humbling. I thought it was a wonderful healing and helpful program, again, whether you're an addict or not. But there was one thing about the 12-step program that I had, I took issue with. And believe it or not, it's the concept of a higher power. Step number two, if you're familiar with the 12 steps, says that we came to believe in a power greater than ourselves that could restore us to sin. And if you're around an addict or somebody who's been around AA, CA, NA, anything A, you will hear them talk about their higher power. But I was like, you know what, if I'm an addict, and if my life is hanging in the balance, or I'm struggling with anything, if I'm desperate and I'm looking for help, I'm not looking for a higher power. I'm looking for the highest power. With all due respect to Major Sergio, if I have access to battalion commander, why am I going to go to the XO? <laughs> because a higher power, a higher power might help me sometimes. 
in some circumstances. But if my higher power goes up against the power even higher than that, then I'm dead. I mean, if my life and my sobriety and my sanity and my future and my kids' future, they're just too valuable to entrust to a B-plus player. I'm not stopping at a higher power. I'm going as high as I can go up the mountain. You see, a higher power, power might get you to a certain point, and it might bring a certain level of peace and healing in your life, but ultimately and eventually, somewhere down the line, that higher power will disappoint you. Somewhere on that journey, that higher power will leave you leaning on a stick, if you will, that snaps and breaks and stabs you in the armpit. And the sting of being disappointed by someone you've leaned on is intense. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have leaned on someone or something that you thought was going to make a difference, was going to make things right, was going to lead you to a better place. And that higher power eventually snapped and broke and stabbed you in the arm. But why do I bring that example up? Because that's a, a biblical example of what can happen when you lean on a higher power. Hit the, hit the next slide. This is taken out of the Gospel of Isaiah. And a little context is this, is that, that, that the nation of Israel was in a conflict with the nation of Assyria. And Assyria was a strong and mighty nation. And Israel thought they needed help. They needed a hand. They needed a higher power. So they leaned on the nation of Egypt as an ally to help them in their conflict with Assyria. And Assyria got whiff of this. And one of the generals, one of the Assyrian generals, wrote this note and sent it to the king of Israel, basically telling him what was going to happen if you, if you leaned on Egypt as a higher power. He said, look. I know you are depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff which pierces the hand of anyone who leans on it. And such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. And so what this general was saying, to, he's saying, Israel, go ahead and lean on Egypt. Go ahead and lean on them as a higher power. Because the time is going to come where you're going to lean on them like a crutch. And that crutch is going to snap, and instead of supporting and helping you, it's going to stab you. It's going to hurt you. It's going to have an effect on you. And the history of Israel is really this story of Israel leaning on these series of higher powers, if you will, and ultimately and eventually having these higher powers stab them in, in, in the hand or in the arm, whenever they, wherever they were leaning. And maybe that's the story of some of your lives as well. Someone or something came along and you said, this is the one. This is it. This is he. This is she. This is that which will bring me out of my, my depths. Bring me to a place of sobriety, insanity, healing, and wholeness. If you Google the term false messiah, it's an interesting adventure it will take you on. You will see charts and you will see lists and pictures of, of higher powers and people who arrived speaking bold promises of what they could and what they were going to do. That they were the deliverer and they were the chosen one and they were the one that everybody's been praying for and waiting for. Men and women believed in these higher powers, these false messiahs. They leaned on them and eventually every one of them broke snap like Egypt did. Stabbing that person in the arm. History is littered with false and failed messiahs who spoke a big game, who claimed to be a higher power, but who had been crushed by an even higher power than that. Hit the next slide. Just a couple of examples. Next slide. Throughout history, in 500 AD, you can look this up. This guy named Moses of Crete. For those of you who don't know, Crete is an island off the coast of Greece. All of a sudden, Moses of Crete felt like he was anointed and called by God to lead his people of Israel back to the promised land. And just like Moses number one, Moses number two was going to lead his people through the water. You know where this is going. Yes, <laughs> you're right. He was going to lead his people through the water to the land of Israel. 
to the promised land. Well, Crete being south of Greece was 700 miles of Mediterranean Sea away right. from Israel. But nonetheless, <laughs> he led his people to the coastline, which happened to be a cliff. And yes, he told them, go. We are going home. We are going to the promised land. And those people walked off the cliff to their death. Moses of Crete thought he was a Messiah. The people leaned on him as a Messiah, as a higher power. But gravity was an even higher power than Moses of Crete. And then we have David Alvey in about a 1200, 1200 A.D. He declared himself a Messiah as well. He lived in northern Iran or north Persia. And he said he was sent from God, same thing as Moses number two, to free his fellow Jews, this time from the weight of the Muslim man, the, the Muslim yoke. And he was going to lead them back to Jerusalem. And David Aure compiled a significant following where he was in north Persia. But he was unable to even defeat the local Muslim militia. And he was killed by his father-in-law while he was sleeping. And so David Alri was a higher power for many Jews, but he wasn't po more powerful or a higher power than a well-armed militia, or even sleep, or even his father-in-law. And he went down into the litter, into the garbage dump of false messiahs throughout history. And then a more modern example, and I even threw his picture in there. I don't know if anybody knows or heard of this guy. Uh, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, he was big in the Pacific Northwest. In Oregon, so big that he actually had a little town named after him. He wasn't Christian, he wasn't Jewish, but he did claim to have a divine heritage and to be a messiah. And he ended up growing the international following teaching meditation and New Age philosophy. And again, he was so big that they actually named a town after him in Oregon. 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 <laughs> His movement, and, and actually true story, my aunt, my aunt, older woman now, but my aunt when I was eight years old would tell me stories about the Bhagwan. She was a disciple. In Rhode Island, this young 20-year-old was a disciple of, of Bhagwan. But his movement began to stumble. When word began to leak out that he had a collection of 90 Rolls Royces and even more wives. Thousands of people throughout the world, including my Aunt Pat, considered Bagram a higher power. And for a few years he was, and he showed himself to be significantly powerful. But money and sex, as they so often do, proved to be even higher powers than this guy. And many of all of his followers, including my aunt, were left searching for the next great hope. Mm. You see, false messiahs bring broken promises. And broken promises bring disappointed followers in search of a savior. And all of these false messiahs are saviors who couldn't save. Higher powers not quite ready for prime time. Which brings us to Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, who arrived on the scene in North Israel in a very fragile time in history with the Romans occupying the land and Israel fighting back. He showed up on the scene out of nowhere with a lot of lofty promises, perhaps even more lofty than anything anybody's ever said before. Jesus, this Jesus, who just came out of this small town of Carpenter, said that those who followed him would never thirst. He had the audacity to say that those who followed him would never hunger. He claimed to have power to forgive sins, this Jesus. Hit the next slide. This slide after that. Jesus stood in one of his first sermons. And he said, the spirit of God, the Lord, is on me. Because God has anointed or chosen me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. And recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Leave that up for a little bit. These are some lofty promises. These are some big words 
from someone who obviously considered himself a higher power. And the question is that we need to ask ourselves, is it, is it true? Can Jesus deliver the goods? Or is he just one of many people, many men and women who came promised in the world and fell to a higher power? Is he like David Alry? Is he like Moses of Crete? Is he like the Bagram? How can we know for sure? Jesus started out claiming to be a higher power, and he made a ton of promises. He said, I can restore your life, and I can heal a broken heart, and a broken spirit, and a broken body, and I can fill that void, and I can renew the mind, and I can do all these things, and I can back up these promises. Just trust me, is what he said. But how do we know for sure? How do we know that we're not just being led down another false path that's going to end up with us getting stabbed in the hand or stabbed in the arm? Well, consider the story the Gospels tell of Jesus going face to face with all of us, an array of higher powers and one by one knocking them all down. I think about Jesus emerging from this small town of Nazareth with big promises but completely untested. And the question that was in people's minds is, who is this Jesus? Can he really be the Messiah we waited for? And right out of the gate, if you know your Bible, you know Jesus was led into the wilderness where Jesus faced three challenges. And during this time, Jesus would confront the higher power of hunger. Well, the devil would go before him and say, if you truly are the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. Jesus would confront the higher power of glory when the devil tempted him to say, go ahead and show us what you can do by jumping down this tower. Jesus would confront in the wilderness the higher power of power itself when the devil said to him, if you just bow the knee to me, I'll give you as the world as far as you can see, and you will rule over it all. And so many men and women, false messiahs throughout history, when confronted with hunger, or when confronted with glory, or when confronted with the lust for power, gave up, tapped out, and gave in, and became overcome by an even higher power than themselves. But Jesus in the wilderness defeated those powers of hunger, glory, and power. And he emerged victorious from the wilderness. He defeated these powers, but yet there were higher powers that he would face. And so not long after the temptation, Jesus stepped into a church and preached his first sermon. And the Bible says that when Jesus was done preaching, all the crowd there, they were astonished because he preached as one with authority, not like the teachers and preachers that they were used to. Jesus, this carpenter, this, this unschooled, hardworking laborer, was preaching a more authoritative and precise and profound sermon than they were used to. This small town preacher at that pulpit during his first sermon was going up against the powers of reputation and education and connection. The powers that said, do you want to get somewhere? Do you want to be someone? Do you want to be a Messiah? Show me your resume. Show me who you know. Where's your ticket to the inner circle? How many self-proclaimed higher powers couldn't even get out the door because they didn't have credentials, because they didn't know the right people or know the right words? Jesus knocked that door down during that first sermon. This uneducated, this unassuming, this, this carpenter wowed the minds, astonished the minds of those there because he was unlike and different than any other teacher that they knew. Power of education power of reputation, the power of connection, were powerless against Jesus. But even greater powers awaited him. Jesus walked out the church and into the community, surrounded by people who were suffering. Suffering at the hand of powers higher than themselves. Powers that they could do nothing about. Threatening these powers threaten to expose Jesus as a fraud, as one unable to really deliver the goods and fulfill his promises. These, these powers of sickness and disease. And the Bible tells a story of Jesus meeting a woman who had been sick for 12 years. And this woman tried everything in her power, a series, a litany of higher powers to help her overcome her personal health. Bible 
Bible says that she lost everything, leaning on these higher powers, hoping that this higher power could do for her what nothing else could. And every time she leaned on this higher power to, to, to heal her from her sickness, that higher power just took her money, just snapped, broke, and stabbed her in the hand. And then, one day she leaned on Jesus. And Jesus defeated the power of sickness. Not bad, but not nearly enough. Because he would soon face an even greater power. Sometimes later, Jesus would encounter a crowd of people who were surrounding a desperate father with his son convulsing on the ground. And this son was possessed by the devil. Demons were destroying his son's life. Demons were destroying his family and his future. And this poor guy, like the, the, the sickly woman for 12 years, had tried everything to get the devil out of his son. And no one and nothing could defeat this demonic higher power. But then Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration and delivered the man's son. Even the devil could not stand up to Jesus. Sickness, demons, pretty good wins for an uneducated country boy. Jesus, throughout the Gospels, paints a picture of one climbing this ladder of defeating powers, higher powers, but there are even higher powers that he would yet face. The Jesus train was gaining speed, gaining traction, and he enters the capital city of Jerusalem, and his disciples, his followers, who he had mentored for three years, were fired up and excited. And their attitude was, if we can make it in Jerusalem, we can make it anywhere. And as we thought about last week during Palm Sunday, the crowds were chanting his name and saying, save us, as he entered the capital city. But almost suddenly the crowd turned against him. Judas betrayed him, one of his followers. Peter denied him, one of his disciples. All the rest of them ran away, leaving Jesus to face his two biggest threats yet. In the Garden of Gethsemane, on the heels of being abandoned by his followers, betrayed by Judas, denied by Peter, Jesus went face to face with the power of rejection and the power of betrayal. And overcoming that moment when your heart is ripped out and stomped on. These powers are dangerous because a hundred yards, they don't look that menacing. They don't look that dangerous. But up close, they're deadly. And one dark night in Jesus' life, they got right in his face. And Jesus stood tall. Jesus defeated the powers of rejection and betrayal. And he's climbing that mountain, and he can see the mountaintop, but there's still higher power that Jesus had not yet faced. Because a few hours later, a few hours after the rejection and the abandonment and the betrayal, Jesus found himself being beaten and nailed to a cross, sentenced to die a criminal's death. And as Jesus was being beaten, bystanders, the Bible says, were spitting on him and mocking him and shouting curses on him. And Jesus had done nothing wrong. And these folks were acting like absolute monsters. And the religious leaders who orchestrated this whole thing were laughing and challenging Jesus, saying, if you really are a Messiah, do something about it. Show us what you got, Messiah. And the crowd that cheered him as he entered Jerusalem one week earlier now were cheering his execution. And at the height of Jesus' agony, Jesus encountered and confronted two significantly powerful higher powers that have done away with many men and many women throughout history. And I'm talking about the powers of hatred and revenge. Yeah, you might be able to preach a good sermon. Yeah, you might be able to heal a couple of people. You might be able to deliver a couple of devils. But in that desperate moment, when you are filled with anger and hatred and revenge, are you going to grab that hammer and strike the glass? Will you let your hatred demand revenge? Hatred and revenge are giants. 
They are lethal killers who make slaves out of the strongest people. And maybe somebody here has lost to the power of hatred and revenge in your life. But Jesus, while he was on that cross, and hatred and revenge and those powers were in his face, uttered three words to defeat them. Father, forgive them. From the cross, with seemingly no weapons at his disposal, Jesus reached deep and defeated two of the biggest giants and powers that we could ever face with three simple words. Father, forgive them. When Jesus uttered those words, the powers of hatred and revenge ran away. And with those three words, Jesus cleared the path. In the three years of active ministry, Jesus had time and time again shown himself to be a promise keeper, capable of standing up to any power, whether it would be hunger, whether it would be power, whether it would be glory, sickness, disease, reputation, education, betrayal, rejection, hatred, revenge. He stood up to them all and won. But even after conquering hatred and revenge, he still wasn't at the top. He still wasn't the highest power. There was still something that he had to answer to. There was still a power that was even greater than that. There was still one power between Jesus and the top of the mountain. Can you hit the next slide? Bam, bam. And here it is right there. The Apostle Paul identifies it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He's very clear. He says the last enemy to be destroyed Amen. is death. And so throughout Jesus' ministry, you see Jesus destroying enemy after enemy that has consumed and corrupted and oppressed his people, his bride, his church. And Paul says the last one, the last to the top of the mountain is death. So with that, would you stand as we read God's word before I preach this message? <laughs> We're going to read from Matthew chapter 28. And as I read from Matthew chapter 28, remember this verse, leave it up there, that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. That that one thing after all of Jesus' ministry that kept him from being the highest power was this idea, this enemy of death. Matthew. Chapter 28, reading out of the NIV. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Matthew chapter 28, verse 6, he is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And when that angel made that announcement that Jesus was not in the tomb, was not dead, that he had been risen, he made it clear that the last enemy was destroyed. Amen. And that Jesus was the highest power. And that Jesus could deliver on each and every one of his promises. Hear me while you continue to stand right now. Come to me, Jesus said, you who are tired and weary and don't feel like you can go on. Jesus promises, I can give you rest. Amen. Jesus said, I have come to bring freedom to prisoners. I have come to bring sight to the blind. I have come to release to the, the oppressed. Jesus said, I 
can give you water when you will never thirst. I can give you food when you will never hunger. He said, the Son of Man, I have the power to forgive sins. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way to the Father except through me. And so I ask as I begin to close this message, which of those promises do you want most in your life right now? Which of those promises mean the most to you? What are you asking God for to do in your life right now that you can't do, that your friend can't do for you, that no higher, that you need the highest power, that you need the one who has defeated them all? What is God, what is your prayer to God this afternoon? You see, if Jesus had been unable to heal that poor lady or deliver that possessed kid, he wouldn't be worth considering this afternoon. I wouldn't bring my problems to someone who couldn't heal the sick or deliver a demon. If Jesus had struck back the bad guys in anger, he might have got himself a decent Wikipedia page, but he would not have an entire faith and religion and change history. If Jesus had stayed in the tomb, any of these promises that he made, he would not be able to fulfill in your life. But the good news in Easter and the good news in the gospel and the good news that I share with you right now he is, that is, risen. Not, is that Jesus has demonstrated that he can keep his promises. And so I'm going to ask the choir to come forward right now as we get ready to close the service. And I just want to make an invitation to you. Do you need not just a higher power? Do you need the highest power this afternoon? Because this highest power, the power that delivered a demon from a young man, the power that brought a woman who had been sick for 12 years to healing and wholeness, the power that had the power to ask for forgiveness from even the most vile, wicked people who were hurting him, that power is available to you this afternoon to tap into. Maybe you need to ask Jesus to come into your life. Maybe you've never asked Jesus to come into your life. And today, this day on April 21st, 2019, will be the day that you cross over from death to life. That you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Maybe you made a decision so long ago and you feel like you turned left when you should have turned right. Or you went, you went left when you should have gone straight. And you want to get back on track. Jesus is the highest power. Jesus can do that. Or maybe you just have a burden that you need prayer for. We're going to all open the altar during our closing song. And if you need prayer, we invite you, we encourage you, we want you to come forward so we can pray for you. So I'm going to ask the choir to lead us in our closing song. And as we do, know that the altar is open, that you can encounter this living, this true, this undefeated Lord. Come forward.